Sail the sea thing, find out before too long. How quickly blue skies can grow dark, and gentle winds grow strong. And suddenly fear is like white water pounding on the soul. Sometimes.
All right, good morning, welcome. Nice to see you today on this good day that the Lord has given us. And this is the day that he's made. We can rejoice and be glad in it. So good to see you. Thanks for coming and thanks for those who are joining us online as well. So we welcome you this morning. We're looking forward to a great morning this morning. And as, uh, as that video shows, we're here to praise the Lord. So we look forward to doing that. But first I wanna mention just a couple of announcements. Uh, you'll see in your bulletin, feel free to look at that. But this week starts uh, Vacation Bible School up at the Second Chance Youth Ranch. Pray for Clean and her helpers and, and for the kids that they'll be uh, uh, learning more about the Christian faith and uh, that people and kids will place their faith in Christ as well. So that's this week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, the first one of uh, four uh, VBSs that we'll be having. Lots going on this week. Tuesday's the uh, card class here at church. Then Wednesday we have our uh, uh, Bible study and prayer time at church as well, 1.30 here. And uh, Thursday night is the ladies' uh, Zoom uh, Bible study. So they're looking at Leviticus and Hebrews together. So if you're interested in being come part of that too, feel free to see Katrina in the back there and, and she can help you with that. You know, also I want to uh, uh, say thanks to, um, I don't see them today, but um, uh, Tom and Carol Myrick. Maybe when you came in, it's been there for a few weeks now, that bench that's right there by the front door. Uh, they uh, donated that bench. Uh, you can check it out, you can sit in it, it's comfortable. Uh, but also I appreciate uh, the other day, I was out here and she was out here for a big part of the day, uh, Carol was uh, just weeding around the church. So we sure appreciate uh, her doing that. So I wanted to mention that. Let's see, I think that's all that I'll uh, mention. You can uh, look at the other things in there. But we have Psalm 54, verse four, it says, Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for today, this good day. We give you thanks and praise and how good it is, uh, uh, how, how exciting it is that we can praise and worship and honor you, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And we're here to honor you. And I pray that this morning would do just that and that it would encourage and, and uh, lift up and help uh, all the people here as well as we turn aside from other things and put our focus on you and give you thanks and praise. For it's in your strong name we pray. Amen. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Please stand as we begin our worship and sing those words. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made, that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made. This is the day that the Lord hath made, that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord hath made, we will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made. Oh, 
Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. Thanks for your singing, appreciate that. Indeed, how great he is, for sure. With all the things going on in this world and all the negatives that we can think on and probably do way too much so to think on, keep the main things the main thing and 
and on what God's doing and how great he is and worthy of praise. And like in the adult uh, Bible class this morning, we looked at from Revelation 1, 18 descriptions and titles of Christ and how worthy of worship he is. And uh, what a, a joy that, that is to see that and get a fuller picture of who Christ is and what he can do and what he's going to do. Well, I'd like to read for a scripture reading this morning from uh, Deuteronomy 10. Uh, Deuteronomy 10, verses 12 through 22, but I'm going to read it from the uh, New Living Translation this morning. Uh, but it should be on the screen as well, yep, behind me there. Deuteronomy 10, 12 through 22. Here Moses is speaking to the uh, people of Israel. They are uh, about to enter the Promised Land, and he's recapping past events, and he's giving them these final encouragements here. And so in verse 12, he says, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? He requires only that you fear the Lord your God and live in a way that pleases him and love him and serve him with all your heart and soul. And you must always obey the Lord's commands and decrees that I'm giving you today for your own good. Look, the highest heavens and the earth and everything in it all belong to the Lord your God. Yet, the Lord chose your ancestors as the objects of his love, and he chose you, their descendants, above all other nations, as is evident today. Therefore, change your hearts and stop being stubborn. For the Lord your God is the God of gods, and Lord of lords, he is the great God, the mighty and awesome God, who shows no partiality and cannot be bribed. He ensures that orphans and widows receive justice. He shows love to the foreigners living among you and gives them food and clothing. So you too must show love to foreigners, for you yourselves were once foreigners in the land of Egypt. You must fear the Lord your God and worship him and cling to him. Your oaths must be in his name alone. He alone is your God, the only one who is worthy of your praise the one who has done these mighty miracles that you have seen with your own eyes. When your ancestors went down into Egypt, there were only 70 of them. But now, the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars in the sky. All right, let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for your word. What a great challenge it is and encouraging to us. And as it says, we were to have this reverence for you, this fear of you, this respect for you, to seek to obey you, because we want to, obe we want to honor you. Because, Lord, you, we love, as your word says, because you first loved us. Thank you for setting your love upon us. And so we give you praise and thanksgiving for that. May our hearts always be filled with praise and our, our mouth, with your, mouth with your singing and declaring your glory throughout the day, because as we read, you are the only God, the Lord of lords, the King of kings, great and awesome in all that you do. Every way that of yours is perfect. And we thank you for your perfect wisdom and your power. Thank you for how you're at work in our lives. And Lord, I pray that you'd open our eyes to see you at work around us and to give you thanks. And Lord, I, I pray for this week we have coming up, we pray for a vacation Bible school that Pray for the teachers and the helpers and for the kids as they come. May they learn about you. May they enjoy their time. And, and uh, we pray that the boys and girls would, would place their faith, their trust in you. And so uh, I pray, too, for this week, the various events going on, the various Bible studies and the ladies' study and, and uh, the other events. Lord, we pray that you would be honored through all these. So thank you for this summer. Lord, we pray as we are getting underway in this summer that, that each of us would, could have a great summer spiritually, that this would be a time where our spiritual lives can grow and, and soar in new ways as we look to you and trust you. So thank you for this morning. Thanks for this good day. Thanks for your refreshing rains. Lord, we pray that the rest of this service might honor you. And we thank you too, Lord, for opening people's hearts and their willingness to give. Thank you for how you continue to meet our needs in all kinds of ways. And so we ask all this now in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Solid. 
solid ground is falling out from underneath my feet. Between the black skies and my red eyes, I can barely see. And when I'm feeling like I've been let down by my friends and my family, I can hear the rain reminding me in the eye of the storm. When my hopes and dreams are far from me and I'm running out of faith, I see the future I pictured slowly fade away. And when the tears of pain and heartache pouring down my face, I find my peace in Jesus' name. In the eye of the storm, I remain in control. In the middle of the war, my soul, you alone are the anchor, and my sails are told, your love surrounds me in the eye of the don't know how I'm gonna make ends meet. I did my best, now I'm scared to death, I might lose everything. And when a sickness takes my child away, there's nothing I can do. My only hope is to trust you. I trust you, Lord, in the eye of the storm. You remain in My soul, you alone are the anchor, and my sails are torn. Your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. You remain in control in the middle of the war. You guard my soul, you alone are the anchor, when my sails are torn. Your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. I said, I will watch my ways and keep my tongue from sin. I will put a muzzle on my mouth while in the presence of the wicked. So I remain utterly silent, not even saying anything good. But my anguish increased, my heart grew hot within me. While I meditated, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. Show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. You have made my days a mere handbreadth. The span of my years is as nothing before you. Everyone is but a breath, even those who seem secure. Surely everyone goes around like a mere phantom. In vain, they rush about, heaping up wealth, without knowing whose it will finally be. But now, Lord, what do I look for? My hope is in you. Save me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the scorn of fools. I was silent. I would not open my mouth. For you are the one who has done this. Remove your scourge from me. I am overcome by the blow of your hand. When you rebuke and discipline anyone for their sin, you consume their wealth like a moth. 
Surely everyone is but a breath. Hear my prayer, Lord. Listen to my cry for help. Do not be deaf to my weeping. I dwell with you as a foreigner, a stranger, as all my ancestors were. Look away from me, that I may enjoy life again, before I depart, and am no more. All right. Thanks, Tim, for that song. The good words to that song, so I appreciate that. And feel free, if you like, there's some uh, message notes in your bulletin. If you want to take that out and follow along, that'd be uh, fine. All right. <clears throat> I've entitled this, uh, Is Your Heart of Praise on Fire or Ready to Fizzle Out? And I'd like to uh, begin by reading from uh, Mark 6, a very familiar story, probably to most. Mark 6, starting at verse 45. It says, immediately, Mark liked to use that word a lot, immediately. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd, because he just got done feeding the 5,000. And so, he sends his disciples in the boat to go to the other side, and after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, uh, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them. So we're talking probably between three and six in the morning. Uh, so still in the night. Uh, walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost, and they cried out. For they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded. For they did not understand about the loaves, what he had just, you know, fed the 5,000 with, but their hearts were hardened. All right. Let's begin in prayer. <clears throat> Lord, thank you again for your scriptures. Thank you for that they are true. We live in an age where so many people think there is no truth. It's whatever is true for you, whatever you feel like, whatever you can fantasize about. Uh, is true for you, and the rest of us are supposed to celebrate that. Lord, I thank you that there are absolute truths. We find them in your word. We find them throughout nature, throughout creation. They are all over the place. And I thank you for them. Without that, life would be total chaos. But I thank you that your truths are based on your character. And so they are, always have been true. They're true today. They will be true forever. And so I Thank you that we can learn about them, study them, apply them to our hearts and lives. Thank you that they really do give us an anchor uh, in uh, stormy times when everybody else is adrift or drifting or going along with the flow. Lord, let us not be like jellyfish that just drift along. Let us be more like dolphins that can swim against the, the current and do very well. And so, Lord, help us to to stay in step with your Holy Spirit and that you would lead us and guide us this morning and open our hearts to understand your scriptures and especially to apply them to ourselves first, help us to keep them and then that we can uh, share them with others and teach others and encourage them with, with these great truths as well. So we give you thanks and we pray this again in the mighty and majestic name of Jesus. Amen. All right, you know, one of the uh, uh, favorite questions every parent likes to ask a toddler is, you know, how big are you? 
you know, and the kids love it, and they get all excited, and they raise their hands, you know, as, you know, and to try to make themselves you know, look really big. It's like they're saying, look, I'm huge. And, uh, you know, we like playing that game with kids. And, uh, but I, I've found that that question only works uh, with kids. You really can't use it on others. For example, if you're, if you're married, if your wife comes to you and says, how big do my hips look to you? You know, if you're smart, you know, you don't, you know, as a guy, you don't raise your hands and go, oh, your hips are so big. Uh, no, and then you might find yourself outside seeing stars and, and it's not even nighttime yet. Uh, but we ask kids, you know, that question because we want them to realize they're growing. You know, we know that you know, how kids think about themselves is very important. You know, we don't want them to think of themselves as tiny or weak or so on. But now I have uh, an even uh, more important question uh, than that one is this, how big is your God? How big is Christ in your life? Uh, the disciples in the boat got a glimpse a little bit how big Jesus is and what he could do. He could even walk on water. Who needs a boat with Jesus around? And that speaks about him. Now, if he was just a man, he, he wouldn't be able to do that, you know, unless God helped him like he helped you know, Peter a little bit there. But if he was the son of God, then yeah, he could do this no problem, no sweat. And I, I believe real strongly that the way we live is in direct proportion to uh, our vision or how big our vision of God is. And you've probably heard this is a well-known quote from A.W. Tozer. Uh, he was so good on this subject, and he said this, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. It's quite a statement. I think it's true. For example, uh, Billy Graham used to like to say, you know, if you have a, uh, a small God, if your view of God is small, uh, you're going to have big problems in your life. But if you have a, if your God is big, then in comparison, your problems are going to seem small compared to him. And so again, our view of God is so important. It determines how we view, really, it determines how we view everything else in life, the things we see happening out in Washington, D.C., the things we see happening in our own lives, it affects all those things in a big way, more so than we realize. So the problem with many is kind of like what um, the prophet uh, Zechariah once told Zerubbabel. You can read about that back in Zechariah chapter 4. But he says, you know what your problem is? He said, well, no, what's my problem? And uh, Zechariah says, your problem is, is that you despise the day of small beginnings. You know, small things. Uh, you know, you're discouraged because you're having trouble inspiring people to get to work. And... And it all seems like a small thing to you anyway and to them. And he says, well, it is kind of a small thing, but it's a real thing. It's a legitimate thing. It's a good thing. And we must not despise the day of small beginnings. Most things start out really small. We must not be despised of that. And Zechariah goes on. He says, you know, God will continue to work in your life and uh, use your part in the overall scheme of things of what he's doing. Uh, you know, you... It's like he's saying, you've gotten so bogged down in the details that you're, you forgot the big picture. And it's just like, you know, I see us here at Pathways that we are a vital and important part of the global body of Christ, of what God is doing all around the world. And so it's important that we be faithful to God's calling on us as a church and on each of us as individuals to do what we can do as we trust God to help us in a great way. But... The problem, again, is for many, is that their view of God is just too small. And uh, in fact, let me list some of the things that can happen if you have a small view of God. Uh, if your view of God is small, you know, you'll wake up in the morning, maybe you'll smell the Folgers, and that might be the best part of your day because the rest of your day might be filled with stress and anxiety and fear because you think everything that's happening or should happen is dependent on you and on your shoulders. And we will seem very vulnerable in this big world. Or if your God is small when we share our faith, maybe you might tend to shrink back because you think 
boy, what happens if they ask me a tough question or something I can't answer? How, how will I handle that? Uh, or if you're a small view of God, it can be tough to be a, a generous person of faith because you think your financial security is all dependent on you or the stock market. Uh, or if you have a small view of God, we may be inclined to compromise or avoid challenges. Uh, because if, if we don't bask in the warm acceptance of God's love for us, and if we don't get our identity from Him, then yes, it's very easy to become slaves of what other people think. Or if you have a small view of God, you know, it can happen if someone gets mad at us. It can get us all twisted up in knots. Uh, because we don't have the security of knowing that God loves us. He's watching out over us. We can trust him. So, you know, if your view of God is small, you might pray but without faith, or you might serve but without much joy, or you might suffer but without hope. All because we've not come to realize that our Heavenly Father and our, you know, our lives really are in his hands, who is totally competent and worthy of our trust that he's all-knowing, and he's a, a very loving Heavenly Father. You know, back in the uh, uh, 70s, there was a movie called uh, My uh, Bodyguard. Uh, any of you remember that? Uh, we saw it in school. They showed it in school. I, not, I don't know why. Maybe the teacher wasn't feeling well or something. But anyway, as best as I can recall, was this, was this little kid in school, and he kept getting picked on by others, especially this one big bully. And so finally, he, he came up with an idea. He says I'm, he was going to hire that, that big bully to be his bodyguard. And so the big kid agreed to it, you know, if, as long as he gets paid. And so uh, now all of a sudden, this little kid had this big bodyguard. And uh, so he, you know, he would, um, it doesn't matter where he goes, you know, because this kid was so big, it's like, if Hercules married Wonder Woman, you know, he might, he might be their kid. You know, I mean, he was big. He, he didn't do much talking. He let his muscles do his talking. You know, he, he, uh, talking wasn't his thing. He, his thing was starting fights and ending fights. So I was, you know, this, this big kid. So now this little kid had him as his bodyguard. He could walk the halls in confidence. You know, he could uh, walk right up to kids in a fight and say, stop it, and they would. Not because of the little kid, but because of his big bodyguard standing, you know, right behind him. Uh, you know, it's, his whole uh, outlet was changed. His whole perspective was changed. You know, no more fear. There's no more anxiety. He could, you know, a dark alley wasn't fearful for him anymore because with his bodyguard there. Uh, again, he had a whole new perspective on life. Now, just think if we could have a huge bodyguard around us all the time. You know, think of that. Let's say if you could have somebody like Goliath, you know, with you all the time. Um, you know, then I could come up and say, uh, I heard you didn't like the sermon. Is that right? Goliath, get him, you know, or something. Uh, no, I wouldn't do that. But, but we don't need one anyway. The believer already has one. Uh, one far greater than any bodyguard you could hire. Uh, and that's Jesus himself. Uh, just like he said to his disciples in the boat, he said, take courage. You know, it is I. Don't be afraid. When Jesus is around, yeah, fear tends to go. We don't have to be afraid when he's around. So, in fact, if you want to read a really inspiring account, uh, one of my heroes of the faith was uh, John Patton, who was a missionary to the, some South Sea Islands. And, uh, and even some of the, on some of the natives on some of the islands were cannibals, and he was sharing the gospel with them, and, and it's, it's an aspiring account of how on several occasions God would send angels to protect him, uh, like his bodyguard, and uh, at times he wasn't even aware of it, uh, but I encourage you to read about his, his life. Uh, very encouraging, very inspiring. But so how do I change my perspective then? How can I live in such a way uh, that shows I believe in a God who is so big. Well, there's a number of ways, uh, you know, like studying creation and look what he's made and it shows his wisdom, his power, and you start looking, you know, galaxies and beyond. It's like, wow, it's just amazing uh, what he has done. But there's a number of ways. But one thing in particular that I just want to point out today, and that comes from our 
uh, story that we read earlier from Mark 6 is this. So this is point one on the sheet. Learn to observe. Uh, learn to observe. That's simple enough. It is, and, and it isn't. Um, it's like Sherlock Holmes used to say. I know he was just a fictional character in um, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's, uh, not, you know, some of his writings, but he had him say, um, many see, few observe. Because he'd just seen, we all see, if you have eyes, you know, that's pretty passive. But to really observe the way Sherlock Holmes would observe things, that takes more work. That's more active. And so that's why I'm saying learn to observe. You know, as in Mark 6, we see that Jesus was about to pass them by. And all of a sudden they see him, and they thought, you know, they didn't realize who it was. They thought it was a ghost, and they were terrified. We need to observe better. There's a, a, a psychological condition called mindlessness. Um, well, in fact, there, uh, you know, if, actually a number of years ago, there came out a book with that title, Mindfulness, Mindfulness. And mindfulness basically means, you know, that wherever you are, be all there. Um, so there, I, I just saved you from having to read that book, so. But uh, uh, mindlessness is that situation where, you know, you may be there, your body is there, but your mind is off somewhere else. In fact, I see examples of it in, in here this morning even. So. Now, if you laughed, that was not, you're not one of them. Uh, look around you to those who did not laugh. Where, where are they at? But anyway, it's a common thing. We all do that. You know, sometimes driving down the freeway and you know, your mind's off somewhere else. Uh, that happens to all of us at times. You know, our bodies are one place, but our minds are off. You know, we're thinking about something else. Real common. Uh, but for some, it's almost a way of life. Uh, I came across this little story uh, from some time back. It says, a writer in the Christian century told about a congregation who had formatted all its services on computer. Okay. And then when a funeral service was to be held, they ran the same liturgy they'd used for the last funeral, substituting you know, only the name of the newly deceased, in this case, Edna, wherever the name of the previous woman, who had happened to be Mary, had been. So they replaced wherever there's Mary, it got replaced with Edna. Well, on one occasion, everything proceeded smoothly until they came to the reciting of the Apostles' Creed during which the people recited together their belief in Jesus, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Edna, <laughs> instead of Mary. Uh, mindlessness, it's, it's one of the things that can keep us from uh, worship. Uh, mindless affects us, mindlessness can affect us too, at, you know, when it comes to God. Uh, you know, we miss things, things go right by us, and we don't even see them. Uh, we don't even notice that God does some unique work in our lives or around us, and we didn't even see it. Or God blesses us in some way, and we don't even realize it. You know, look for these things. Uh, look for examples of God at work in your life and in your world. You know, we used to call them, you know, God sightings. You know, or sometimes something happens and you go, God, I just know that was you. You know, thank you for doing that. Uh, God sightings. Look for these things. Um, you know, uh, God's at work every day in our lives. And like the disciples, you know, Jesus passed by and uh, they didn't realize really what was going on. Uh, did you know that Jesus is at work in your life right now, uh, this day? And, and he will continue to be. So, you know, are you aware of it? You know, what, what is he doing in your life right now? You know, what, what is God teaching you right now? He is seeking to. We need to be aware and looking for these things and being open to those things. Because uh, again, yeah, Jesus is at work in our world, but again, do we see it? We need to learn to look for these things and observe better. Like the Bible encourages us in one way, like it says, you know, to wake up and understand what hour it is and especially the lateness of the hour. There is a uh, theological concept called uh, prevenient grace. Uh, which basically says or means that um, whenever you go, you know, let's say whenever you go somewhere, 
uh, God's already there. He's gone before you. You know, he's, so if you go somewhere, God's already beat you there. You know, he's a lot faster than we are. And so when we get, come into wherever we go into a situation, we don't have to ask first, well, what should I do? We ask first, we learn to observe and we go, what is God doing here? Because God's already here. He's already at work in this situation. Even before we got there, he's working. What's he doing? And, uh, you know, what's really going on here? And, okay, now what, what can be my part? What can I do to, you know, be, you know, join in with God with what he's doing here? I like that, prevenient grace. Because, you know, why do our lungs keep filling with air and we don't even pay attention to it? Uh, you know, why does the sun keep coming up every single morning uh, without, you know, anything from us? Uh, or let, uh, let evolution try to explain how a little larva can turn into this creepy little cr caterpillar, you know, creeping along, and, and then turn into, you know, make a little cocoon, and then uh, turn into this beautiful butterfly within days. It doesn't take millions of years for him to evolve into that butterfly. Evolution has no answer for that. Uh, that's kind of an embarrassment to evolution. They don't really like to talk about that one and many, many others. But, uh, you know, or where does all this beauty come from? If it's just survival of the fittest, what place, why is there beauty at all that doesn't seem to do anything? In these hidden mountain values, you know, valleys and places where nobody's ever going to see them, there's all this beauty. Why is that? Or, um, you know, all these things I think cry out, you know, God is alive, God is real, God is good, God is at work. God is so big, we could say, unless we're mindless and we miss all these things. Well, let's not, let's learn to observe. And then uh, I have point two on the sheet, respond and worship. When we see how big God is, we see him at work in our lives, in our family's lives, uh, it, should lead us to worship. Notice the disciples response. Uh, if we look in Matthew 14, uh, starting I'm going to start at verse 31. Here's the same story, but in Matthew. And uh, this is in Matthew, he uh, adds this element to it. This is the same, the, he just got done feeding the 5,000. They go on this boat, the storm comes, Jesus goes up on the mountain to pray, and he's you know, purposely waiting till you know, the fourth watch of the night. And then he comes and they go, ah, they were terrified, it's a ghost. And then you have this situation where Peter says, okay, Lord, if it's you, you know, tell me to come walk on the water. And Jesus, fine, come. And uh, Peter starts off doing well, you know, walking on the water, wow. And then he takes his eyes off Jesus and look, what am I doing? You know, and he sees the waves and he starts to sink. And of course, Jesus immediately rescues him and they get back into the boat. And then you have verse 31, it says, Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And then this, And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Interesting. And those, it shows, even has the power over the wind. And that struck them. And they said, And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. See, earlier, and we, have, we read that section in Mark uh, 6, and Mark 4, they'd ask the question, who is this guy? And he's, starting, he's answering that question, and by him walking on the water, he's answering that question in another little, gives him a, another perspective on who he is. He can walk on water. Well, no man can do that. You know, truly you are the Son of God. And it leads them to worship. And that's the response I wanted to point out, that when we see God at work, like they saw Jesus, what he's doing, this should lead to worship. And that's what they did. So what I'm talking about then really is that more than it, it, seeing these things should lead us to worship and not just on Sunday morning. So I'm not just talking about, yeah, we should go to church on a Sunday morning. That's a good thing. That's the right thing to do. Unless you can't, then that's why we got the live streaming for it as well. Appreciate the guys who make that possible. But you know, coming to church Sunday morning is just a start. You know, that's Sunday. There's six more days of the week. Uh, you know, in some ways, uh, what I do here Sunday morning is not all that different than what I do the other days of the week. Uh, instead of preaching to you, I, I preach to Debbie. Uh, <laughs> poor girl. 
I say, now listen up, here's what's going to go down around here. And she goes off and does whatever she wants anyway. And then I take up an offering. And she doesn't even put anything in there. No, she doesn't do that. But, but what I mean is that you can worship anywhere. We know that, but do we do that? Uh, we can worship anywhere and we should. You know, wherever I go, uh, can be, we can be open to seeing glimpses of God at work and uh, in his creation or in his providential care of us and we can respond with worship and thanks. I think, do we have that verse, uh, Psalm 71? I think we do. You want to put that up? Yeah. You know, may this always be true of us. It says, my mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. Isn't that a great, that's a great prayer. And may that be true. What a good thing in these days of so much negative news, so much deceit and manipulation of everything that to focus on the positive things and what God's doing and uh, lift our eyes off the details and to see the bigger picture of God at work and how his everything prophetically is falling right into place. Um, that's encouraging. And so our mouth can be filled with praises. You know, I sometimes wonder if boredom in worship or boredom in life, uh, it's not so much a matter, say, here in church of uh, song selection or style, um, Although we all have our preferences in those, and that's fine, that's normal, of course we do. And usually our preferences are pretty strongly held because music affects our emotions. And our emotion, you know, once our emotions get involved, you know, we f hold those convictions pretty strongly. Uh, and we all have preferences, of course. One thing we need to remember is that the song that you might not, not like is very often is somebody else's favorite song. I remember that a few years back, I commented on some song to someone and. As a man that thinks so dated needs to go, and they go, what, that's my favorite song. Okay, yeah, but um, anyway, uh, you know, but I wonder if sometimes boredom and worship is not so much, uh, uh, or might be more of a result of spending, let's put it this way, spending too much time in the boat, okay, like the disciples did, and not taking steps of faith, like Peter did, willingness to step out of the boat. Uh, See, when one gets involved in God's purposes, so you have the Great Commission of making disciples of every people and tribe and tongue and, and involved in the Great Commandment to love God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind, and to loving others uh, as ourselves. If we're not, you know, when we get involved in those types of things, God's purposes, that, uh, you know, life can really become, life becomes exciting then. It's like you, it can become like being on a mission trip all the time. And you're, you know, looking for where God is at work. And, and then you can worship anywhere, anytime, in a crowded mall, uh, by yourself, in a corner of a room. It can lead to worship. Because people involved in God's purposes and his plans and his great causes, for one thing, they have great fellowship and, uh, I think, too, great worship. But when people become preoccupied with themselves and their eyes are on themselves, uh, they have to be drawn out of themselves so that they can really learn to worship and to see God then and to honor him. Uh, I've noticed that if you're in a group that is focusing, trying to focus on let's have you know, fellowship and worship, it's too easy for it to become kind of a strained thing. But when you get a group of people who are uh, uh, moving in God's plan and they're fu fulfilling God's mission for them, you know what the results of that is? Man, they have great fellowship and they have great worship. It's more of a result. Um, so, you know, it's like, man, let me tell you what God did for me today. And it doesn't have to be some big, you know, thing. It doesn't have to be some big burning bush encounter. But just this whole area, again, of learning to see and, and appreciate what God's doing. To see it and appreciate it. Because uh, he is at work. So trust him that he, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. It's kind of like uh, dogs in a kennel. You know, you get dogs in a kennel, they'll bark at each other and they'll snap at the flies around them and so on. And, but you get those dogs out of that kennel, you get them out in the field and, you know, they're on the hunt or they're chasing that, you know, grouse or, or, uh, or even if they're just chasing a squirrel, you know, they don't have time to bark at the little flies around them, the little things, you know, because they're doing what dogs are supposed to be doing. And in fact, that's actually a principle of spiritual growth. 
I like to call it the kennel rule. And you could phrase it this way. Uh, you can tell if your heart is growing colder to God when little things bother you more than you know they should. Okay, let me say it again. You, you can sense or you can tell that, you, that perhaps my heart is getting colder to God when little things start to bother me more than I know that they should. Um, you know, th this doesn't mean that little things are unimportant or should be ignored. I'm not saying that. But you know how sometimes it is we let little things just bug us and annoy us, and we go, why did that bug me? That shouldn't. That's such, you know, that's a little thing. Uh, and little things can bug us. Um, it's like it's been said, I like this statement, you know, how, uh, especially here in Minnesota, little things can bug you, and if you don't think they can, uh, you know, you've never slept in a, you know, small tent uh, out in the woods and with the mosquito buzzing around you all night, you know. You're in there and you can't see it and it's dark and you're slapping yourself and you're, you know, trying to get that thing. Uh, yeah, it can be pretty annoying. But uh, in life, though, if we're letting what we know to be little things uh, get us all out of sorts, then perhaps we have lost perspective on how big and how caring uh, our God is and what we can be doing for him. Uh, again, your view of God directly impacts how you live. So get to know God better. Study his attributes. Study his character. Read your Bibles. Get to know God better. Oh, that, you know, we might be uh, exuberant worshipers of God with a, with a, a holy delight and a real joy. Uh, maybe you're an expressive worshiper. Uh, I hope we all are. Uh, some are more so outwardly, and that's great. Um, but that exuberance that's in the heart. Um, now, you know, I've mentioned this, I'm basically a Scandinavian. Uh, we're not known to be too expressive. Um, you know, we don't swing from the chandeliers and stuff. Uh, uh, you know, you've heard it said a Scandinavian extrovert to somebody who, instead of always staring at his own feet, you know, might actually lift his head a little bit and stare at your feet, you know, but they don't make eye contact. Um, or if you're a Scandinavian, if someone, you know, you catch a Scandinavian saying things like, you betcha, or, or, you know, that was pretty good, or yeah, sure. Well, you can, you know, he's getting pretty worked up. And that's about as worked up as he's ever going to get, too, right there. But anyway, uh, that we might be exuberant worshipers of God. Uh, now let's learn to see God at work and respond with worship. That would be my main point, I guess. Learn to see, learn to observe God at work in your life and respond with praise and thanksgiving. You know, how, along with that is, I want to ask this question, how are you going to do, how are you planning to do, uh, how are you going to do spiritually this summer? Uh, do you have plans to make it a great summer spiritually? I hope so. You know, besides the usual things we do in summer and, you know, family get-togethers and so on, what are, you, what are you planning? What are you going to do to make sure this is a great summer spiritually for you? Uh, you know, if you want to compare your spiritual life, let's say, to a campfire. You know, we like campfires in the summertime. Uh, is, is your spiritual life, comparing it to a campfire, is it more, is it like a, a, a campfire that's burning hot and bright? Or is it like uh, maybe the fire is just down low, but you've got that you know, deep red bed of embers and it's burning on? Or is it about ready to fizzle out? What are you going to do about that? What's your plans for having a good summer spiritually? You know, as Peter stepped back into the boat in this situation, uh, you know, maybe, maybe the other disciples uh, asked him, how big is Jesus anyway? And Peter could raise his hands and say, Jesus, so big. And indeed he is. Every time you face your fears or uh, uh, take a step of faith, your, your worship can grow a little deeper and your, uh, your view of God can become a little bit bigger. So Jesus isn't finished with us yet. That's good news. He's, but he's looking for people who will dare to trust him, no matter what's going on in our lives, in our world, who will trust him. Uh, he's looking for people who will not let fear have the final say. Uh, God is at work in this very stormy world in this present darkness. And we have the opportunity to answer his call. So let me ask that, what's God calling you to do? 
or to make right, or, or someone to forgive. Maybe there's someone you need to forgive in your family, or a neighbor, or a co-worker. Uh, and, and you're thinking, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna forgive unless he asks, comes first. And, you know, he might be saying the same thing. Uh, no, we take the initiative to go, and without any defensiveness at all, uh, we seek to make things right and be willing to forgive. Or maybe there's someone you just need to have a lot of patience with. Uh, some people try our patience more than others do. And we need to be willing for, to do that. Thank you. I'm so thankful for your patience with me. Uh, maybe there's some problem to, uh, that you, he's calling you to trust him with. Maybe a new problem in your life. Maybe it just came up this week. It's a new opportunity for you to trust him. Or a new opportunity to boldly step out, like Peter did, in faith, and make a fresh start. Well, let's close in prayer. Lord God, the God of the universe, of all that there is, you've created all things. You're the great creator who always was and is and always will be. You are the living one. You hold the keys of death and Hades. What man can say that? No man can say that. And so, Lord, continue to remind us of who we're dealing with here. I thank you that you're our redeemer, our savior, the living one, the, the Alpha and the Omega. And Lord, we're here to give you praise and thanks. And we ask that you might open our eyes to see you at work in our lives and in our world and, and to, to pray and to ask you to show us what it is you're doing and how can we better understand what's going on and what is it that you're teaching, teaching me, teaching us, so that we can then respond with praise and thanksgiving. Lord, help us to trust you. Whatever may come in this new week, Lord, our trust is in you. Whether storms come, whether clear sailing, whatever, all those things come at various times. Lord, help us to trust you and give you thanks. And so, Lord, we do that now. We give you thanks and we praise your holy name. Help us to be joyful worshipers with a holy delight in you and what you have done and what you are doing in our lives and what you have promised you will yet do. Lord, help us to continue to do better and standing on your promises and trusting you through all things. So thank you for this good morning. We pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand for the closing hymn. to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Thanks for coming. Have a great day and a great week.
to rain. 